So welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons, second World Commons Week events, uh, the regional keynote webinar for Africa. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons Executive Council, and I'm the organizer of the World Commons Week event. Uh, as you may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating and promoting both commons research and practice. And we have two primary components this year. One are coordinated local events around the world and uh, a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. The latter is one of IEAC's efforts to promote global dialogue on commons research and practice by taking advantage of internet-based webinar technology allowing our community to gather virtually while reducing our community's carbon footprint and the impact on the global atmospheric commons. So let me, before we get to this, our speaker, let me explain how the webinar will work. Uh, we've asked our distinguished speaker to talk more than 35 minutes. I'll act as a timer. I'll provide a verbal or a, a, a text reminder uh, periodically. And the last 15 minutes will be left for questions and answers. Attendees, um, to ask a question, right now you're muted, but please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you move your mouse to the bottom of the Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A box that you can click on. And if you're at a computer, you can uh, type a question in that box. I will monitor those questions and uh, um, I'll read them to the speaker on your behalf. Uh, in part, we're doing this to keep the, um, the bandwidth low as possible so we all can hear Ruth when she talks. For attendees who have called in via phone, you can let me know that you have a question by dialing star nine to toggle or raise your, your hand function next to your name. I'll see that hand raised and I'll unmute your phone so you can ask your question. So uh, turning to uh, the introduction to our speaker, it's a terrific honor for me to introduce Ruth Mains and Dick as our uh, keynote speaker for the Africa region for the World Commons Week today. Um, I have to say, if it wasn't for Ruth, we might not even be having this webinar because uh, in Utrecht, we were walking down a street going to a restaurant and the idea came up to do the World Commons Week events. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we'd be doing this had Ruth not we had had that dialogue. Um, Ruth is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute with over 25 years experience in transdisciplinary research on the commons, especially land and water with experience both in working in Asia and Africa. She's an author of over 150 peer review publications based on this research and was recently in 2019 the recipient of the Eleanor Ostrom Award on Collective Governance of the Commons, the Senior Scholar Award. Uh, again, uh, we'd like the attendees to hold their questions until the Q&A session at the end, unless you have a clarification question. If you do that, again, I'll be monitoring the Q&A window and the raise your hand function if you have one. So with further ado, uh, Ruth, thank you so much for preparing the talk and all yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the, the honor really is mine to be invited to give this um, webinar for the Africa region, uh, especially because I'm sitting in India at the moment. Um, but the Commons is a long enduring passion uh, for me and uh, it's been something I've been working on throughout my career. Um, what I want to focus today on is the importance of securing the commons and the role in particular of tenure and governance in that. So why, uh, you know, what does that take? Well, we have this framework we've been using for some time for identifying the key institutions for the commons. And this, you can look at the the time scale from short term within a season to long term over generations and the spatial scale from the plot to sort of the community, group, community, nation, and even global. Simple technologies or resource management practices like planting seeds, high yielding varieties are short term 
You can do them on a plot. They're pretty easy. The minute you're starting to talk about longer term invest uh, management practices like soil carbon or planting a tree, agroforestry, they're still on a plot, but there's a long time horizon. And if you don't have tenure security, if you don't have property rights, you don't have the authority or the incentive to make those investments to do those. As you move up the spatial scale, integrated pest management, for example, relatively short term, but you can't do it by yourself. So in those cases, you need to start worrying about coordination. And so much of what we care about in terms of natural resource management, climate responsive um, resource management practices in particular, are at large spatial scales. So um, they are in some sense a commons. Now, at higher levels of those spatial scales, the state may have an advantage in um, some kind of coordination role. But at lower levels, the state usually cannot effectively um, provide that coordination. So collective action becomes important. And what's really important is how state and local institutions interact on this in sort of a polycentric governance framework. When you get up to greenhouse gases and these kind of global issues, then you have to think about international institutions as well. Now, this sort of red circle area, we can think of as forms of commons. Does that mean then that we need formal organizations and land titling? I mean, that's often the, the reaction we get. And my response would be no. Collective action involves more than just organizing a meeting or a, an informal group. And property rights are more than just a title. What I hope to talk about today are more appropriate ways of thinking about particularly the, the tenure security, but also the governance. And especially more appropriate for Africa, certainly, but I think there's important lessons from Africa and the innovations that are going on there that apply in other regions of the world as well. So what do I mean by tenure security? Um, I've often used this uh, definition by Frank Place, Michael Roth, and Peter Hazel um, that talks about tenure security in terms of the breadth or robustness of the rights. Those are, what are the bundles of rights? The excludability, the duration. Do you have enough time to reap the benefits? And assurance. Is there some kind of institution behind them that will enforce the rights? And can those rights withstand challenges from you know, outsiders or insiders? What I found really interesting was that definition was sort of a, a theoretical definition written down in 1994. And in 2009, Awanyo in the, this uh, paper on Ghana talks about this Ghanaian local idiom, um, and I won't try to pronounce it, but it's land that gives me peace of mind to meet my goals. But literally that peace of mind is keeps my ears cool. So when I talk with people about that paper, they always say, oh, you mean the ears cool paper. But I think it's really cool that Ghanaian idiom contains all of these um, aspects of, of theoretical land tenure security that are things that are too often forgotten in a lot of the work on tenure that focuses just on ownership or titles or registration. And I think it's important that we think about these broader things. When I said that there's an institutional framework that will deliver on it, one of the important things that throughout my 
work on legal uh, on property rights has been the importance of looking at legal pluralism. That there are multiple legal frameworks that back up um, any kind of property rights. Those can be um, international law, um, state law, religious law, um, custom, and uh, pro even project law. So if you're talking about water rights, there are things like under the, the um, there are some general broad principles about right to water. There are national laws. There are religious laws about not denying water to the thirsty and a whole bunch of customary. The other really critical point, uh, and I know this is uh, familiar to a bunch of you, but I just want to be clear about it, is that we need to go beyond ownership to look at bundles of rights. I have often used the Schlager and Ostrom classification of bundles of access and withdrawal as use, use rights, and then management exclusion and alienation as control or decision-making rights. But there's also another framework that's used derives from Roman law that's used a lot in West Africa, which is the use, um, usus, usufructus, and then um, the sort of the alienation. The usufructus is the right to profit from, or the, here it's written as the right to exploit resources. That emerged in some work we were doing in Ghana, Ethiopia, and Tanzania about um, irrigation uh, about women and it didn't you know looking at their right to profit from irrigation now what we see a lot in the, the sort of general literature and thinking is that there are three uh, types of property public property private property and common property and the notion is that public property all of those rights are vested in the state. And in private property, all of those rights are vested in the individual or the legal individual. And common property, those rights are supposed to be vested in some kind of a collective, except that you almost never find the alienation right vested in the collective. In fact, especially in much of Africa, but even in other places, it's more complicated than that. You might have the state having certain rights, the community having other rights, um, groups within the community, and the household, and then the individual. And I think it's, you know, so thinking about um, even if you have the right to, to cultivate in the wet season, others may have the right to graze across that land in the dry season. And, and of course, the um, negation of that right has been a, a source of much conflict uh, with pastoralists. But I want to talk about some really promising approaches for securing the commons. Um, UNDP, UN Habitat, I mean, sorry, UN Habitat talks about the continuum of tenure. And I think that's important, that there's not just one model that can secure rights, and certainly not titling. Among those uh, um, ways of securing tenure, land use planning is, uh, is one approach, and I'll, I'm going to give some examples of that, especially for pastoralists. There are various hybrid approaches um, and I'll give some, an example on that for water. And then community registration, uh, registry, registering the land for the community within, the uh, within broad boundaries, and then looking at the bylaws within that. So I want to end with an example of that from forestry. Um, here I'm drawing on work of Fiona Flinton and colleagues at at International Livestock Research Institute that, talk, that are doing really creative work on land use planning, 
um, with International Land Coalition and various national partners and EFAD support. Um, and uh, participatory rangeland management in Ethiopia and Tanzania. They've developed methodologies for this and then implemented them. In Ethiopia, um, we see that, that um, they've, they've developed a, a, an eight-step process that leads to an agreement with the local government to secure access to land, um, and a community action plan. That's been just within uh, three pastoral communities. There's, they've gotten to 2.7 million hectares that secured land for 23,000 households. And they've been able to document really significant benefits for the community, including for women in the community. Oh no. Okay. In Tanzania, a joint village land use planning, um, Tanzania has a village land use planning process that leads to certification of land. That has often led to focusing on individual tenure, which then um, has actually, in many cases, uh, undermined the rights of pastoralists to collective, to, to the commons. This, Joint village land use planning works across multiple villages. And um, they've supported the, in this four, four different clusters of villages, they've secured around about 175,000 hectares of grazing land. The innovation within that is that they've, they've developed, instead of individual certification of rights of occupancy, they've gotten government uh, clearance for issuing group certifi certificates of rights of occupancy. Um, and they've piloted this uh, building on the experience from Ethiopia. Community members have reported that as a consequence of this, uh, or that there are opportunities to invest in sustainable land management have increased. And in many cases, they've attributed that directly to this, um, this joint village land use plan process. Um, moving up to um, work that's been done in North Africa, in Tunisia, Ayman Frisia of Ikarda has been looking at ways of improving rangeland governance um, and uh, using Bayesian belief networks of looking at what are the factors that, that affect um, problems or improvement in rangeland governance under different types of tenure of private only collective only or private embedded in tenure. And for example, found that diversification of the economy causes governance problems when there's competition between private and collective tenure. But um, well-performing community-based organizations contribute to good governance under this private embedded into collective tenure, which is the most constraining land tenure system. Clarifying boundaries of rangelands has also enhanced um, uh, rangeland governance under the collective and private tenure. Um, those are the, the dark blue um, squares there. Interestingly, public investments <clears throat> can cause conflicts and negative effects on rangeland governance if it's not well coordinated with the, the local communities. Um, and there's a, a, he's got some really rich methodologies and information behind this. I'm gonna switch into water rights um, briefly because this is a passion of mine, but I'm here I'm drawing on work of Barbara Schreiner and Barbara von Koppen um, uh, and International Water Management Institute and Pegasus Institute. Um, before I go into their, their work on hybrid water rights, I wanna say that in the work that I and others have done on water rights within Africa, um, customary water rights in many places 
fly in the face of our commons work that says, oh, commons are not open access. In fact, a lot of customary water rights uh, in the African context are explicit about the value of open access, that open access is itself a value. There are, um, there are proverbs that even, uh, even the, um, the jackal or the hyena should not be denied water. Um, and those are not popular animals, but that you, know, you, you just don't deny water to anyone as a notion of customary water rights. Um, that is generally thought to be for basic needs. And that gets into a little bit of trouble when you, you start to get into highly water consumptive uses. So what um, uh, Barbara Schreiner and Barbara von Koppen are arguing here is, um, sorry, What's happened a lot then is in response to that, there's the imposition of, of permits and you can't use water without a permit, but having a permit gives you the right to that water often ahead of others. Um, what Barbara Schreiner and Barbara Van Koppen are arguing for here is using a mix of legal tools that, you know, basically a polycentric multi-level governance where you focus on statutory water permits only for the high impact, high volume water users and those that might be doing pollution also or highly polluting. And other users would be exempted from those permits, but their water use regulated through um, customary water law and elevating that to an equal legal standing with the permits or general authorizations, or where you prioritize according to the water use. So you say, drinking water is always ahead of other, and then other domestic water, and then small scale uh, livelihood uses, and then that's above some of the other. Or you can issue collective permits to groups of water users, but don't expect lots of small scale water users to acquire water permits because it's just not gonna happen. Now I wanna to turn to forests. And here, you know, I said uh, you can designate the boundaries of um, uh, land that is certified for groups um, and register the commons under something like that. But that doesn't necessarily provide security of tenure for everybody within those boundaries. So when I talk about security of tenure on the commons, that's a two-stage process. First of all, the group has to have secure tenure, and then within the group, you have to have secure rights. Often we find that women in particular do not have as secure rights uh, within the commons as men, and, and in many cases, neither men nor women have secure rights because of outside threats. So in Uganda, Esther Mwangi of C4 has done work on uh, the gender dimensions and found that women expressed a lot of concerns about the forest and tree rights because they were excluded from the decisions um, making, even though they were important users and they played an important role in the management of both the forests and the trees. They weren't in leadership positions. They often didn't attend meetings for a variety of reasons. And, um, and then they, uh, there were cultural norms that, um, that prevented them from planting, owner, owning, and benefiting from the trees. Remember that point I said about the fructus rights, the right to benefit economically. So even if they grew the, grew the trees or, or uh, harvested the products, that they didn't control the income from it. So C4 engaged in a process of adaptive co-management, ACM, 
of interventions to address these concerns. And what they found is that um, the, um, as a process of this, there were changes in women's leadership and overall participation. Higher uh, membership in the, the, uh, in the executive committee, um, women planting uh, trees and owning them, and then planting of some of the higher value trees, uh, especially the, the ficus tree, women were not supposed to plant it because planting a ficus tree symbolizes ownership of the land and that was threatening. Um, and women were planting uh, lots more trees, eucalyptus included, that was providing both subsistence, firewood, and commercial use. Um, women's attendance in group activities increased, they, they had more confidence, and uh, they contributed to, even before, even if they, women were present in the meetings, they didn't participate in the discussion. Um, after the ACM, they were really participating in the discussions, um, and they were in competing for political leadership, and lots more planting trees by women and men. How? Through capacity building, building vertical linkages with the uh, forest authority and the NGOs. Um, the ACM facilitators were really spent time creating this safe, non-intimidating space where, um, where women could speak, but also working with men to show that the benefits of, of this group action, this collective action, would not just be limited to, to women. There was also effort to create alternative livelihood activities so that it was worthwhile for women to invest in the trees, uh, because they would be able to like um, control the income. Um, formal registered groups also provided legal recognition for that collective action, as well as security for that tenure on the forests and the trees. All of this required engaging beyond just the community level, but certainly within the community, intensive engagement. Um, that gives you a broad sweep of these. Um, some of these resources are here, uh, are listed here. Um, and I will uh, send, I will add links to even more of these resources. If any of the people whose work I'm drawing on are participating, I hope you will um, help answer the questions uh, that might arise. And I'd like to stop now and, uh, and take questions so that we have, have time for some discussion. Oh, okay, I finished early. So, yeah, but, Ruth, you did a very nice job. And um, we have a, a little extra time today, which is great. Um, thanks so much for your talk. And I'm sorry you can't hear so. people applauding. <laughs> Um, Ruth, let me suggest actually you open up the question and answer window on your desktop and maybe uh, you, can, you can see the questions um, as they come in. Uh, attendees, uh, a reminder, if you move your mouse down to the bottom of the, uh, your Zoom screen, you should see a Q&A uh, option. If you click on that, that should bring you a, open up a window where you can type in a question. Uh, and, and Ruth and I will both monitor those questions coming in. I'm also watching the attendees uh, panel screen that you can't see, but I can, um, in case anybody raises a hand and wants to ask a question that way. Okay. Um, for, some, for me, what you say is at the bat bottom, Okay. Is at the top of your Zoom. Is at the top. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah. So yeah. Just in case somebody can't find their way to it. So we'll, uh, I'll let people continue to look for the Q&A. Feel free to type a question in or raise your hand. Ruth, one thing I, I while we're waiting for questions, one thing that came to mind for me 
is, you know, reflecting on your, um, your lifetime experience of studying these cases. So for anyone that's on the, the, the call um, who's maybe in the earlier stage of their career, how, how do you approach any particular field case? Like, what, like do you have a, a framework in your mind after you know all of this time of studying these cases, I'm curious how you approach it now and what, what kinds of uh, words of wisdom you have for people who are interested in doing um, case, case research like you have. So I think one reason why I am really adamant, passionate, whatever, about these frameworks like legal pluralism and bundles of rights is that I started out in water and all these people were working on water rights and I just never saw it, water rights as relevant because none of what I was reading about on water rights, which tended to be based on Colorado or places like that, seemed to have any bearing on what I was seeing in India or, or uh, Zimbabwe which were the first places I was working on this. And then I um, discovered legal pluralism. And suddenly it's like, oh, well, yes, state law is largely irrelevant. The way the government was defining water rights was largely irrelevant to what I was seeing in the field, but but if, if I understood that there were multiple sources of water rights, then I could start to unpack it. So um, I was working with Rajendra Pradhan, an anthropologist in Nepal, and just a nut, which well Pradhan, a number of people. And, you know, I could start to get a framework so that I could actually understand what I was seeing or what people were telling me. And similarly, looking at bundles of rights, once I, I had that notion, then, um, then I could um, understand why it was right, okay for people to do some things and not other things. And if you want a reference on that, Goretti Nabanoga for her uh, from who's now at Makerere University in Uganda, uh, in her dissertation has just a fantastic uh, explanation about how within forests in Uganda, you know, so and so person X has right Y to to use product Z from this in this season for this purpose. You know, it's it's really can be quite specific, but for the commons, those the specificity and these particular bundles of rights are what allow us allow people to accommodate sharing of resources and overlapping and multiple uses of resources. And if we recognize that multiple multiple uses actually end up sometimes having far more value than if you, um, if you cut it off and just let one person have all the rights to one piece of land. Um, this is really clear in, for example, the subdivision of the Maasai group branches. Um, I went on a field trip that had been organized uh, by Patty Christensen and Robin Reed outside of the Nairobi National Park. And, you know, under the um, previous collective tenure, there were pieces of land that, that had mineral licks and others that were good for dry season grazing and wet season grazing. But when you subdivide it, you couldn't, um, you know, one person might have the mineral lick, but not the wet season or the dry season grazing. Esther Mwangi's dissertation 
um, that she did um, under Eleanor Ostrom on the subdivision of Maasai group branches also shows you know how how this doesn't work as well so i um i think looking um there's a great quote and i can't remember exactly right now but of understanding property rights not as the external imposition of these rights but from how it's experienced from below can we make sense of that well, thanks okay, now for, I, I see there are questions. But, uh, thanks for the, thanks for the, um, the answer. Mm -hmm. I, I have a response, but I think I'm going to, if you look now in the yes. Q&A, there are four questions, but before that, we have a hand up that was first. So I don't know who it is, admin. Um, I've just, uh, oh, it's, yeah, yeah, I've just unmuted you, I think. And Ruth, while, while we're waiting for, this to take, um, look at the Q&A. Yes, right. Um, Edmund, can you talk? Can you hear us? Uh, this is uh, the Institute of Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies class in Cape Town. We have a question. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes, please. Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned so my name is Syriac Hakizimana from PLAS in South Africa. Uh, you mentioned by passing in your presentation something like a private land right embedded in a collective land tenure. I think we were discussing about land tenure system in Northern Africa. Can you please elaborate on that? And the I'm second, sorry. if Could I you may. Repeat that? Could you repeat that? It was, it was uh, the, the um, voice here is a little garbled. So you mentioned something like private land rights embedded in the collective land tenure. I think you were discussing about the Northern Africa land tenure. Yes. So rights being embedded in the collective, you say? Yes. Can you please elaborate on that? Yes. So um, that um, a lot of the, the conventional Western models of, of rights are saying just what's the right of the individual. But I think there are often, um, it, under a lot of commons law, you have rights that, that uh, uh, so, okay, I know, I know, sorry. I know what you're, uh, what I said that you're asking about. That the, the right of an individual is only as secure as the right rights of the group. Um, let me let me think of a different way of saying it. If if I am um, a person uh, near a forest, my right to use that forest, uh, you know, a community forest, um, is not going to be secure unless my community has secure rights to that forest. So if, if loggers can come in from outside, then I won't have secure rights. But also, I won't have secure rights to that if the um, community forest user group is composed of all men who then close the forest and say, um, we're gonna close it, nobody can, can come in and collect sticks or uh, collect fodder, but I need the, I need the forest for, for uh, fodder or sticks. So unless I have some voice in that decision making, my rights won't be secure, but my rights also won't be secure if the group doesn't, doesn't have the, the secure tenure. And here that's really important because as well, Kloss and Liz Eldon Wiley and others have shown often the commons is less secure in its tenure than, than private or more individualized uh, pieces of land. Did that answer your question? Okay, I think we're going to. Uh, 
Ruth, do you want to just go down sequentially in the question and answer sure. yourself, or do you want me to read them? Um, I think I can. Uh, I, well, I guess the first one seems to be um, more of a comment. It's good to know that the dis discussions around tenure security in customary tenure systems are moving away from the rigid style of titling to consider other less known but equally important mechanisms for securing title. And yes, I, I see that as really encouraging. I think there is still a, a need to keep, keep vigilant on that. Um, just recently, I was writing a blog and for an organization and the editors where I was talking about in Ethiopia, the, the joint certification of men and women um, had beneficial effects for women's tenure security and their investment in the land. And my blog got rewritten as joint titling that provided women with ownership was giving all those benefits. And I had to push back and say, no, you know, because that would, that would lend arguments that, oh, titling is the way to go. Um, but that, that also uh, relates to Kofi Alinon's uh, question or comment and question. Registration and formalizing collective rights can also lead to acceleration of selling community lands. What could be the precautions to take? That is, uh, that is a really good point. As you know, um, that is part of what led to the, to the um, dissolution or the, the individualization of Maasai group ranches was you know, vesting the, um, uh, the, the, the alienation rights in the group. And this can be particularly problematic when the value of the commons goes up and you get outside um, organization or outside agents, shall we say, who want to acquire it and might go to the chief and have the chief sign off. This, you know, the, the whole land grabs debate in Africa is, is dealing with that. Um, uh, free prior and informed consent by the group is is important um, you know human rights watch is doing important work on um, highlighting some of these issues so you could say well you don't vest the alienation rights in the collective that is one approach but uh, another approach is just to, to put in lots more safeguards such that you can't alienate without a much broader consent. It's just like within the household land registration, you want to, um, you know, uh, the consent clauses, for example, that, that the head of household or the man cannot sell the land without the consent of his wife uh, and sometimes wife and children. So, you know, the, these consent clauses, I think there are some examples on that. I hope if there are others in the audience who know this better than I, you can also give, give examples of precautions. Um, El Marie is, how can one go about to convince holders of private property rights that a broader perspective of property rights does not mean that they are expropriated and need to be uh, compensated? Um, hmm. So you mean, for example, that um, if somebody holds private property rights, but is um, that you should allow um, people to graze their, their herds or flocks across your land during the um, dry season, that that's not what uh, Americans would call a taking that you have to be compensated for. Um, 
perhaps a step on that is is first of all to not um, to not try to copy a Western style exclusive ownership in in the first place, and um, to that when there is registration of rights, that some of these other other overlapping rights um, be included. And there are some examples of this that I know of, but right at the moment I can't um, think where. But actually, what something we were just yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, so Elmarie's raised, uh, oh, hand raised, and I've unmuted Elmarie. If Elmarie, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, okay. well, thank you. I think the question relates to a scenario as um, I perceive the situation in South Africa to be, where before 1994 and in the apartheid regime. We had this system of private property rights and a, a big component, in, uh, the biggest component of the community and the nation were excluded from acquiring property rights into natural resources. But since um, 1996 and the promulgation of the constitution, um, there are a lot of areas where the law has changed, particularly in relation to water rights, particularly in relation to uh, mineral resources. And there is a huge debate about land. Now, what is true is that the ownership concept has indeed um, evolved quite substantially. But the question is, the issue of the commons is now really an, an, a point that are being discussed in South Africa and the question whether some resources are not common resources but the reality is that the majority of those resources are still being regulated within a primarily private property rights paradigm and to change the paradigm is going to need very inventive um, ideas, and I think that is actually what I wanted to convey with the question. Thank you. You can mute me again. Yeah, no, you. that's I, I. You're absolutely right, and and you guys um, are doing really important work. I uh, on trying to shift this paradigm. And I, I really appreciate that. In fact, I'm, I should say, when I see the list of people who are participating, um, I shouldn't even pretend to be the one answering this because uh, I, I see quite a number of uh, lawyers and researchers who have done a lot of work in this area um, that I uh, am constantly learning from. Um, Kofi uh, raises Kofi Alinan raises the issue that I meant you mentioned without insisting on bylaws as useful in the bundle of rights. My opinion is to give room in national legislation to the legitimacy of local bylaws in governing certain types of rights at community level. Uh, example of convention localis in Western African Sahel. Um, yes, I I think that is very important. Um, and Namati does quite a bit of work on that of, of saying, okay, you know, you secure your boundaries, but then within that, you uh, you set have to set bylaws. And then looking at the extent to which those bylaws, the existing bylaws are discriminatory or are you know, not aligned with the Constitution, but then as long as those are aligned with the Constitution, those should have uh, have considerable weight. And in a way, that's what I'm getting at with this idea of, of the two triangles, um, you know, in, in there, that you want the state and the, and the community to be, be reinforcing each other and working together in there. Um, I should probably go a little bit quicker because I realize that time is passing and, and I want to um, 
turn over to Charlie at the in about a couple minutes. But Douglas, we yeah, we have about six minutes to go. Okay, for you. Okay, Douglas uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a young career researcher on tenure and rights. I'd like some thoughts on how would you approach the study of rights at the individual level, e.g., individuals within a village or group of villages. Um, very interesting. I think that would depend quite a bit on whether you're talking about, you know, what kind of village, whether you're talking about pastoral or, you know, agro-pastoral or, or forest dwelling and all. Um, there's, in terms of the rights of the individual level, there's a lot of resources on um, how to understand women's land rights that can actually be used to look at individual rights. Um, so it could be of, of young men or women, um, for example. And um, Cheryl Doss and I did a paper on this for uh, the Women's Land Rights Research Consortium of what would be the indicators of tenure security and how might you go about thinking about that. We realized that that was within more private property. And now um, I'm working with uh, Fiona Clinton and Ann Larson, um, Ileana Monteroso and uh, Rachel Knight and Cheryl to apply that at the, um, to what would be the indicators and what would be the questions about women's land rights within collective tenure. That might also be a, um, an approach for looking at um, individual rights within the village or group of villages. This, um, the, I don't know if you can still see it, this uh, source book um, yeah, on weird. rights. We can see it. That, that one has some resources on that as well. And then uh, Selorm, sorry, I didn't finish typing my question. I was wondering whether you could share your experiences on the fluidity and dynamism of customary tenure and whether this should be viewed as positive for adapting to changes or otherwise. Also, with overlapping rights over land, what are your thoughts on the definition of tenure security as one that could be fluid and change from one planting season to another? In other words, should the discussion of tenure security move toward definitions that are contextually defined by specifically the tenure groups? I believe local prescriptions of tenure security are important. In many communities, local knowledge denies what is uh, or defines what is secure or not, we should make use of that. I agree with you very much. Um, for one thing, it's, it's really different between a pastoral system and a forest system or a, a system where you're you know, growing agricultural crops. It's different when you're in a peri-urban area. All of that, the 10, you know, so you don't want just one prescription. I think in certainly the experience from a lot of pastoral systems is that, is that fluidity and dynamism is a source of resilience. Um, sometimes when I'm talking about property rights, I give two, in, two pictures. One is of, of fences and stone walls as this notion of rigidity and keeping people out. And another is of a, a stream going across sort of terraces. And the second being more fluid and dynamic. But the point is that property rights are fundamentally a social relationship. Property rights are something that connects people and Understanding that as a starting point is important, um, I, I feel. Um, and it's especially important if we're talking about the commons, is that it's these connections. Yeah. So, so, so I think Ruth, that's- I'm oh, sorry. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead and finish. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That was it. Okay. And then there's the one more question oh, that okay. just came in, and Sorry. we'll take that one, and then oh, it looks like there's actually two points now, okay. um, and then we'll go to closing. Okay. Okay, Kofi, I will save the, the PowerPoint, and and I'll add in some of these other references, and then Paula uh, Sarang Sarangumba. I'm doing research on youth and gender dynamics on tenure and governance. Any thoughts on youth participation in collective governance? Um, yes, I think that is very important. And it's um, because uh, if youth do not have security of tenure, they're not going to invest. I mean, they're not going to be participating in this. And, you know, this, this is important for the the future as well as for their well-being now. Um, it's going to be, uh, um, and but one thing I want to say is that often when we talk about gender, people think about women and youth, they think about young men. And it's important to look at, at you know, both of those involving both women and men. Um, and I'd be happy to follow up with you further, Paula, about this. Um, so, and then, yeah, but, and then if you'll allow me, Charlie, uh, I'd like to advance to, to please. one more slide before I turn it over to you. Please. Okay. Um, I, oh, and I gotta say this without choking up too much. I mentioned that I was drawing on the work of my former colleague Esther Mwangi extensively here. I had just started to pull in some of her work on this presentation over the weekend when I heard that she had passed away on uh, Saturday. So I want to acknowledge that and this, this seminar is in her memory. She was not only a fantastic scholar of the commons, she was a, a wonderful colleague and friend to many of us. She was active in the International Association for Study of the Commons. And I just want to, to acknowledge her role and, and continue her memory and encourage those of you who are working on the commons um, to continue because she would have wanted that. Thanks. And now I'll turn this over to Charlie. Um, yeah, so Ruth, um, well said. And let me say on behalf of all of us with IASC that we too are um, extremely sad about Esther's path, passing. She was an insightful common scholar. And as you said, was a very important and active community and leader in the IASC community. She was elected as the IASC elective executive council member uh, for the beginning this year. So I know I speak for the entire IASC community and others in the common scholarly community when we say she'll be greatly missed. And we send our love and support to all our uh, friends and family at this difficult time. So th thank you, Ruth, um, for those words. Um, before we close and, and thank Ruth for a, a great talk, I just wanted to uh, let you know about um, upcoming events this week, World Commons Week 2019. Uh, you may have heard in the beginning, uh, we, tomorrow we have China scheduled. Uh, an interesting problem has arisen with uh, the, um, I think related to trade wars, where now Zoom is not accessible in China. So uh, our colleague, um, Bert Wang, Yang is uh, working on a, a solution. Uh, we'll try to get that up on the China website. Uh, I should say that that talk is gonna be in Chinese as well. Um, let's go to the next slide, Ruth. Uh, North America is on October 9th. Um, this is Dr. S uh, Scott Shackleford of Indiana University. I'm um, talking about uh, uh, kind of new commons areas. And, and even though the title doesn't say it, he's gonna be talking about commons, common issues in, in this talk. Next one. On uh, October 10th, we have the Asia talk, uh, Professor Hun Cho. Um, who uh, you can see the, what he'll be talking about. So that's on October 10th. Next slide. Latin America will close out the week with uh, on October 11th with Ileana um, giving her talk on uh, tenure reform processes. Uh, next slide. 
And I'm happy to say that uh, thanks to the IASC uh, community and others, um, we've moved from 31 local areas participating last year to more than 50 um, participating this year. So this event's starting to grow, which is what we're hoping we'll do. We'll continue to do this as we move forward. So thanks for everyone um, involved in local event organizing. If you're interested in more, go to that website. Next slide. And I just wanted to uh, mention that there is an, uh, the third IASC workshop um, happening in uh, Tempe, Arizona, March 12th and 13th of 2020. Uh, there's a call at that website if you're, anyone's interested in attending that. And next slide. And if you, uh, to close, um, I, I wanna somehow find the function to open up the, unmute everyone so we can all clap for Ruth uh, for giving such a great talk and all the work. Uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so Ruth, it's going on, I'm sure. <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, if you've appreciated what's going on, uh, my, our uh, colleague Evaristo, uh, who uh, runs the ISE Regional Coordinator for Africa, couldn't be here and sends his regrets, he's traveling but he wanted to remind me, remind you that um, to, to consider joining IESC uh, to build up the representation um, for people doing work in Africa. And he's also planning online events for IESC Africa in July 2020. So uh, go to the IESC website to look, keep an eye on that. So with that, uh, boy, we finished perfectly. Thank you, Ruth, so much for the talk. Thanks, especially to the attendees and all their wonderful questions. Really appreciate it. We'll record this and save it. This, this will be on the uh, ISC uh, uh, World Commons Week website, and uh, I need to talk to uh, the ISCcommons.org uh, web people to see if we can get it posted there, too. Um, I know there was a question about the PowerPoint slides, Ruth. Maybe we can actually post those in a PDF form or something. All right? Yeah, I'll send you okay. a version of that. Thanks, all. Thank you, Ruth, again. Uh, enjoy your day, whatever time zone you're in. Yes, Bye -bye. okay. I brought in my, my one uh, African ISC member uh, in person, so we'll go celebrate. Thanks a lot to all of <laughs> you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm turning the meeting okay. off now. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.